hosting today's webinar with me is Maria Macedestuya, representing Digital Scholarship here at the IAS. We're glad you could join us and hope that you're excited as we are uh, for learning of another door that opens to promote and enhance scholarship while introducing new tools to access, analyze, and study materials in a, in a different way. So it's, it's really a great pleasure for me to introduce our four speakers of today who will present the exciting ongoing project, uh, Pshat in Context, a project for the study of pre-modern Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology in its historical development in different cultural and linguistic environments. Giuseppe Veltri was professor of Jewish studies at the University of Halle-Wittenberg and now since 2014 is professor of Jewish philosophy and religion at the University of Hamburg. Since 2015 he's also the director of the Maimonides Center for Advanced Studies in Hamburg and since 2017 director of the Academy of World Religions. His field of research are Jewish cultural history, Jewish philosophy in the Renaissance and early modern period, magic, biblical tradition, and translations. Among his many publications, several monographs, uh, 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 there, there, there are numerous monographs, and I, I just want to mention two, namely Renaissance philosophy, Renaissance philosophy in Jewish Garb, Foundations and Challenges in Judaism on the Eve of Modernity, April 2009, and Alienated Wisdom, Inqu Inquiry into Jewish Philosophy and Skepticism, De Goiter, 2018. Raimund Leicht is Ethel Backenroth Senior Lecturer in the Department for Jewish Thought, History and Philosophy of Science and History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His fields of research comprise the history of philosophy and science in Jewish culture in the Middle Ages, cultural and religious history of Judaism in late antiquity, Jewish Christian context and Christian Kabbalah, and the history of the science of Judaism. His books include uh, Astrologumena Judaica, Untersuchung zur Geschichte der Astrologischen Literatur der Juden, um, which was uh, more Siebeck in 2006, uh, as well as Verzeichnis der Hebraica in the Bibliothek Johannes Reuchlins. Michael Engel obtained his PhD at the Divinity Faculty at Cambridge in 2015. Since then, he has served as an academic coordinator and researcher at the Pshat in Context project. Um, he studies the Hebrew and Latin scholastic Aristotelian traditions of the Mid medieval ages and the Renaissance, and in particular, the work of Jewish translators in, translators in Italy during the 15th and 16th century. His publications include a monograph entitled Elia del Medigo and Paduan Aristotelianism of 2017, and a forthcoming study published by the University of Rochester Press deals with the Hebrew into Latin a translation of Averroes' epitome of Plato's Republic. Florian Dunklau has earned his MA in Jewish and Arabic studies at the Martin Luther University Halle-Wittenberg and is currently a PhD student in Jewish philosophy and religion at the University of Hamburg. And since 2014, he's a research associate in Chat in Context project. His edition and English translation of Obadia uh, Svornos uh, or Amim will be published in 2022 um, together with the uh, additional translation of the Latin by Giada Coppolo. Now the four presenters will speak for about 60 minutes. This will leave us some 30 minutes for discussion in the end. Um, and please type your questions and comments by using the, the, the chat function either during or after the presentations. And now without further ado, I pass the floor to Professor Veltri. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine, for the presentation and also the invitation to present the study of pre-modern Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology. Uh, just uh, okay. I will be very briefly on the uh, history and uh, the content of the Institutes of Jewish Philosophy and Religion in uh, Hamburg. Uh, to present the the humus uh, of the of the project of uh, the pshat that is the topic for today, uh, the Institute of Jewish Philosophy and uh, Religion was created in 2014 with uh, of, with uh, the uh, the calling me uh, uh, as a professor there. There is a, a MA 
uh, uh, Jewish study, uh, Jewish philosophy and religion, and uh, several projects. One of them is uh, the, the Maimonides Center for Non Studies, the uh, Jewish skepticism, the Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, that does mean that you you can apply also for for a several a several months uh, of research in in Hamburg. Uh, the central aim of uh, this center uh, of the Maimonides Center is to explore and research skepticism in Judaism. And this is dual manifestation, but clearly the social tradition and more general expression of skeptical strategy, concept, attitude, and culture of field. It does mean it, uh, that we uh, do not only research into Judaism, Jewish culture from the beginning until today, but also the parallel uh, uh, development of, uh, of a skeptical tradition in Islam and Christianity, for example. Uh, we published uh, in this day a call for, uh, for applications for the last year, 2022-23, uh, based on limity of reason, lim uh, limits of reason, limits of skepticism. You can apply if you want, you can find in our homepage. The second project uh, uh, already mentioned by Zabina is the, uh, the, the, uh, the edition, uh, translation, and commentary of uh, Ovadia Sforno. Ovadia Sforno is so important with the treatise, Life of a Nation, because of the double, of the double uh, uh, perspective to be the last scholastica, at the same time, also the very, very, uh, uh, very imbued with, uh, with, uh, 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 um, Averoistic, uh, Averoistic philosophy, that's important. The project is already finished. We are uh, finishing now the edition, the translation into English of all the forms. Second project is not my project, my project of my colleague, uh, Patrick Benjamin Foch, uh, about the, the Sifre Musar, the, the Jewish moralistic writings for early modern period. That is a, a, a body of, a, of a knowledge, a body of literature, very important is to know Judaism from early modern until now. Important, we also uh, issued a database, conference in Inventory of the Musa books, printed between 1474 and 1813 in Hebrew, Yiddish, Judeo Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian. There are some major studies in the handbook, and the team is working on. The other, uh, other fields of research are the manuscript culture, and uh, now are two different, uh, two different uh, ideas. One is on magic. Magic is some essential element uh, to, be, to be tasted, to be seen, to be, to be uh, realized. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 the Dr. Uh, Dr. Michael Kors is working on a monograph on uh, the, the, the the material, material, material or materialistic culture and, uh, and the magic uh, and the materials of manuscript paratext interaction between manuscript and, 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 and uh, um, uh, uh, writer, the magic and the persistence of manuscript culture and so on. Also, there will be uh, a fabrication soon on the sciences and magic. It is very briefly, but you can see all the all the all the what I I I, I told you. You can see also in the, on our own page at the University of Hamburg. And now I will hand over to um, uh, to uh, Raymond for the continuation of the presentation of Fisher. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Giuseppe. Uh, you have, we've heard about uh, a lot about Hamburg. I'm talking to you from Jerusalem, where we already have evening. So good evening from, from Jerusalem. Um, the Pshat project I'm going to talk about is a cooperation between the, the Hamburg University uh, and the Hebrew University since, uh, since its beginning. And uh, first of all, thank you again, Sabine and Maria for inviting us to present this research project, Pshat in Context, this webinar of the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies. Now, normally these uh, kind of, um, uh, in the glorious past, so to speak, these kind of presentations were an opportunity to, to meet scholars, to see scholars face to face and to discuss things and to break through the anonymity of uh, the production of academic knowledge um, and to enter into direct dialogue. 
in the present format, it's only half the case because you can see us, but we can't see you, the participants. Uh, but we are very optimistic and we very much hope that this presentation will add to the creation of a scholarly community, which is actually one of the main targets of Pratt, and to create a, um, a dialogue between scholars working on the philosophical and scientific traditions in the Islamic world and Europe in the pre-modern period, of which Jewish philosophizing and Jewish engagement in scientific activities is an integral part. So we are very eager to hear your remarks at the end of this uh, presentation, your criticism, suggestions, and eventually perhaps even some compliments and encouragements either through the chat here or via email through the database project. I would like to add at this point a preliminary remark. What we, the three speakers of the presentation today are going to talk about today is not really a technical introduction about how to use the Pratt database, this digital multilingual thesaurus of pre-modern Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology. You will, you will see and learn about some of the search functions and other data resources available in the Pratt database, which is by now already for a couple of years freely accessible online under the address uh, www.prat.org. But again, this will be not be the main focus of our talks today. And those who are interested in learning more about the database and its research functions, we even have an online uh, tutorial, which you can find on our website. So what we rather like to do here today is to present the Pshat in Context research project within its different scholarly and research contexts. We would like to explain first what the Pshat project actually is about, what we are doing when we are talking about the formation and development of Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology, and where we stand or where we see ourselves within the broader research context of the study of Jewish philosophy and sciences in the Islamic world and in pre-modern Europe. In a second part, and this will be the presentation of Merkel Engel, we will try to outline our methodology of research and explain how we try to study and analyze the Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology within its different contexts, within the context of the concrete texts in which they appear, and these texts within the wider horizons of Arabic, Judeo-Arabic, and eventually also Latin textual and terminological traditions. In a third part, presented by Florian Dunklau, we will present the challenges a digital project such as Pshat faces within the realm of contempor contemporary digital humanities. As a research, research project, we stand within the context of other similar and connected research projects, and it is our intention to create tools and an, a working environment that allows for an optimal intelligent usage and access to all these resources. We will thus have three parts in our presentation. One part will be, be the general outlook, um, part two, the methodol methodology of our project, and part three, shut within the context of digital humanities. Now I will disappear, no, half disappear, because I'm going to share my, my screen with you. For my talk. So what is actually Pshat in context? So let me start uh, to explain what the project Pshat in context actually is about. If people from Jewish philosophy ask about the project, and I know that I have only three minutes to answer the question, I normally say Pshat is a project that aims at building a digital thesaurus, a kind of dictionary of the philosophical and scientific Hebrew terminology in pre-modern times. And then I add, it is a kind of updated and digitized internet version of the old Klatskin dictionary. Hold on, does it work? Yep. The old Klatskin dictionary you, you probably know. Now, I do not know whether you, in the people who are in the audience, actually really know who the old Klatskin is. It's a famous four volume Thesaurus Philosophicus published in Berlin in the years. 1926 to 1934, which served generations of scholars as a tool for reading Hebrew philosophical texts. But even if I'm saying so, that it's a kind of updated Klatskin, um, and there is a kernel of truth in it, because in fact, Pshat, the Pratt project started off as a new Klatskin, this description of the topic and targets of our project is quite imprecise. 
although apparently similar in structure and aims, like the thesaurus of Klatskin, both are thesauri of pre-modern Hebrew philosophical terms with explanations and quotations documenting their usage in historical sources, the underlying research interest and intention is fundamentally different. The old Klatskin was initially a project for the revival of the Hebrew language in the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, in, exp in an explicitly parallel manner to um, Eliezer ben Yehuda's great dictionary of the Hebrew language, Jacob Klatskin was browsing innumerable historical sources, source texts in Hebrew in order to identify those terms that could serve him in his attempt, attempt to create a modern Hebrew philosophical terminology. And in his personal case, I'm speaking now about uh, Klatskin, with the purpose to translate the Jewish art heretic Spinoza into modern Hebrew. However, by doing so, Klatskin almost entirely ignored the historical, linguistic, and cultural background of his sources and disconnected the Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology from its organic context, the philosophical and scientific culture, Jewish and non-Jewish in the Islamic world. It is one of the main targets of the Pshat in Context project to add this missing perspective to the terminology, terminological um, research. But in order to make it clearer what this research target implies and why it is important for the study not only of Hebrew terminolo terminology, but Jewish Hebrew philosophical and scientific texts as part of a continuation of the philosophical culture that had developed in the Islamic world, please let me make a fresh start. To put it perhaps in a slightly provocative way, but one can say Hebrew does not have a privileged status as a language of Jewish philosophizing and Jewish philosophy. There are, of course, innumerable philosophical works written in Hebrew, but many, if not most of the works that of what we generally call Jewish philosophy were not originally written, composed in, in that language, but they were composed in Greek, Arabic, German, French, and other languages. It would certainly be a mistake, however, to conclude from this the opposite, which means that the Hebrew language was altogether marginal in the history of Jewish philosophizing. But its place within it is highly ambivalent and com complicated in more than one respect. The most enduring and influential encounter of Jewish culture with philosophy and the sciences in history in pre-modern times happened in the Islamic world between the 10th and the 12th century but it happened almost exclusively in Arabic and Judeo-Arabic Judeo -Arabic, and not in Hebrew. On the other hand, Hebrew texts as objects of philosophical in interpretation and inquiry assume of course a central role in Jewish philosophizing. But perhaps more importantly, the traceable reception of most of the key works of he he uh, Jewish philosophy was based upon the Hebrew versions. In addition to that, there is, so to speak, hard evidence, material evidence for the vitality of philosophizing in the Hebrew language in the form of an enormous amount of Hebrew philosophical manuscripts that fill long shelves in library collections. And last but not least, philosophy, once integrated into Jewish culture, exerted strong influence on many other branches of Jewish culture. And this again in Hebrew, now heavily informed by new terms and concepts. The role of the Hebrew language for the history of Jewish philosophy, Jewish thinkers and modern scholarship alike is also underscored by yet another quite widespread though highly problematic idea, which is the one that philosophical texts written by Jews in languages other than Hebrew somehow reach their authentic form only in their new Hebrew garb. An early example in case of this attitude is nobody less than Maimonides who maintains that the translation of the guide from Arabic into Hebrew was tantamount to extracting, I'm now quoting Maimonides, extract, extracting the precious from the worthless and the restitution of a lost object to its owners. And last but not least, even for many contemporary scholars, medieval Hebrew translations of originally Arabic or Judeo-Arabic works still serve as the first and main access to these texts. 
even if later on the original versions are also consulted. In fact, the modern editions of the original works of, Jewish philosoph of the Jewish philosophical classics, in fact, never really succeeded in the history of modern research in replacing the medieval Hebrew translations at their main or at least first textual basis for the study of these works. This leads to an almost paradoxical situation in the in modern and contemporary study of Jewish philosophical, philosophical texts. Hebrew somehow is the language of the study of Jewish philosophy, but at the same time for academic scholars interested um, in many of the key works of Jewish philosophy, the major aim of reading the Hebrew texts is generally not so much to take that specific linguistic form of the text as the ultimate given object of inquiry, but rather to read them with the expectation that somehow they can ad adequately serve as a kind of transparent medium for the study of those concepts and ideas that lie beyond their concrete linguistic formulation. If a Hebrew rendering of a word of a work is not sufficiently transparent, it is one of the main targets of any interpretational enterprise to remove, to remove what can be called the linguistic stain that causes the lack of transparency and to make the Hebrew form of the text invisible through interpretation. Within this situation of the study of Jewish philosophy, in which the Hebrew language assumes this highly ambivalent position of being, on the one hand, a standard language of Jewish philosophizing, but at the same time remains unseen, so to speak, it is one of the major targets of the Pratt and Project context to achieve both. More consciousness for the linguistic aspects of Jewish philosophizing in the Hebrew language, just to ask what is this philosophizing in Hebrew as a historical phenomenon, what happened in this transition from Arabic into Hebrew and so on, and at the same time to systematically reintegrate Hebrew philosophical and scientific terminology, uh, the philosopher's Hebrew, so to speak, into its organic contexts, contexts, mainly within the terminologies and intellectual discourses in the, uh, in the Islamic world. Since in fact, without much exaggeration, one can say that from a terminological and conceptual point of view, point of view, pre-modern philosophizing well into the Renaissance in Italy, into this period, is a continuation of the reception and acculturation of Greek, Greek science and philosophy that started in Baghdad in the Abbas, Abbasid period, just in the Hebrew language. Traditionally, the beginning of, Hebrew, of philosophizing in the Hebrew language and the philosopher's Hebrew is associated with the so-called Thibonite school of translators in southern France in the later 12th and 13th centuries, when refugees from the Almohad persecutions in Al-Andalus made efforts to disseminate their cultural heritage among Jews in their new homelands. Although there is some truth in this account, it becomes more and more clear to us in the Pratt project um, and in the terminological research that the shift from Arabic to Hebrew in Jewish culture was a much broader historical phenomenon that occurred in many parts of the Jewish world from the end of the 11th uh, century onwards. Although, although the phenomenon as a whole is still ill understood and needs more research. But be this as it may, the transition from Arabic to Hebrew and the reception of philosophy and sciences in Jewish culture based upon the Hebrew language was preceded by a long and intensive period of about 300 years that involved a whole scale acculturation of Jews in the Arabic speaking world, a phenomenon often called um, the creation of Arabized Judaism. Now it is interesting to see that the linguistic Hebraization of this Arabized Arab or Arabicized Judaism was never studied systematically and in a methodologically sound manner exactly in the field where it is most obvious, in the field of Jewish philosophy. And this is actually what we try to do in Pshat. The Pshat um, in context project can nevertheless, even though it was never studied uh, systematically, um, rely on the research of some predecessors, important predecessors from other fields of research. And here I would like to share again my screen. Um, okay. 
the true father of the modern research of the medieval philosophers Hebrew and its philosophical terminology was not the Klutzkin I've mentioned before, um, but the little known Austro-Hungarian scholar Jacob Goldenthal, who lived in the 19th century from 18, um, 1815 to 1867. One of his main fields of research were the Jewish reception of Arabic philosophy. The most relevant study of his for the present purpose is his Grundzüge und Beiträge zu einem sprachvergleichenden rabbinisch-philosophischen Wörterbuch, published in Vienna, 1849. Based upon the intensive study of two previously added Arabic into Hebrew translations of other philosophical works, Arabic philosophical works, Goldenthal formulated in this booklet a complete and comprehensive research program and points out to the best of our knowledge for the first time in the history of research that the apparent difficulties of the philosophical style of medieval texts are not due to a deficient command of the Hebrew language, but rather the result of a conscious imitation of Arabic morpho morphology, syntax, and terminology. Unfortunately, Goldenthal's far-sighted research program was largely abandoned and neglected by the following generations of scholars. It grew only, it grew only gradually again in the first decades of the 20th century, and it is, it, is, it is associated not so much with historical studies on Jewish philosophy, but rather with Hebrew historical linguistics. It was from the 1930s onwards that Hebrewists con uh, connected to the newly established Hebrew University started to reveal a kind of systematic interest in both the Judeo-Arabic language of medieval authors and the Hebrew language that developed under its influence. For this independent brand of Hebrew, they coined the term Arabicized Hebrew, Ivrit Meshu Arevit. For the first time, this layer of the Hebrew language was raised to the status of an independent stratum in the history of the Hebrew language, which deserves independent linguistic research. Without going into many details here, this Studies of scholars like uh, David Hartwig Barnett, uh, Naftali Herz, Tosi Naito, China, uh, Polotsky are of prime importance here. A seminal work um, in this field is uh, Moshe, Moshe Gottstein's uh, Syntax and Vocabulary of Medieval Hebrew as Influenced by Arabic, published for the first time in 1951 and then republished in 2006. Admittedly, Arabic was not the only language that influenced the Hebrew of the Jewish philosophers. There was also a kind of Latinized philosophers, philosophers Hebrew, but the Arabicized Hebrew was certainly the most important one. In that sense, it is the target of the Pshat in Context project to document, study, and analyze Hebrew technical terms from that field as they are historically documented in the literary sources. For that purpose, we manually, so to speak, really read those texts, manually browse a large corpus of Hebrew philosophical and scientific texts, both originally written in Hebrew and translations from other languages, such as Arabic or Latin, and single out technical terms from the fields of philosophy and science, which we study and document in the Pshat database. So in that sense, Pshat is not a concordance and it's not a dictionary of all Hebrew, medieval Hebrew language, but an interpretation of specific terms that we select from them. Now the differentiation between technical terms on the selection of technical terms and ordinary language is of course uh, not without methodological pitfalls, but heuristically we use a formula that seems to us to be useful to draw a line between words and expressions that are generally used and understand without further preparation and those that stand out as having a kind of special meaning, a terminological meaning within philosophical texts and contexts. These can be, and this, these are the heuristic tools which we use, either words that initially are inexistent in ordinary, in ordinary language and were newly coined or imported um, for philosophical contexts, such as, for example, Hayuli for meta. Secondly, words that assume a meaning that is considerably different from that in ordinary or earlier language, such as Homer, which actually means something like clay, or words that designate entities 
that become thematic in phil philosophical discourse and thus assume a more precise meaning, like classical biblical words as nefesh or ruach, which assume it uh, as a ter terminological meaning in philosophical discourse. What unites all these technical terms, according to our definition, and these are the things which are the words that we are studying in Pshat, is in fact that from a semantic point of view, they cannot be properly understood by readers or listeners unless he or she possesses an adequate professional philosophical background and sufficient information that unveils their specific meaning within a text or context. In that sense, the meaning of a technical term is defined by what a person needs to know in order to understand it correctly and comprehensively. And in our case, this is in many times a philosophical and scientific discourse in the Islamic world. I, I'm adopting here uh, a model or a formula which comes actually from linguistics from the field of frames, what is called frame semantics. semantics. We will hear more about that from, from Michael uh, in a few minutes. There are many different aspects to this phenomenon that actually really deserve scholarly attention and where we hope to open more research, which I can only briefly mention here. We have a vast amount of, de of data and details which we are assembling in the database, but what we need to develop is the periodization of Hebrew terminologies, because there are in fact enormous differences between Hebrew terminologies throughout the ages. We still need to develop criteria for the description of terminological crystallizations and standardization versus continuous fluidity, because we have really um, standard terminologies which uh, uh, um, from modern perspective are a standard, but we're far away from being standard in, the, in history. We have to better understand the pragmatic aspects of the development of the Hebrew the philosoph philosopher's Hebrew, what practical use and purpose philosoph philosophizing in Hebrew had. And we have to study the long durée development of the Hebrew language for philosophy and science through the ages up to the present. And last but not least, one of the major tasks is the development of a typology of terminological innovations. Here I only can very briefly uh, mention a couple of uh, 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 types which, which we discover in, um, in our text. One is the adoption of existing Hebrew words which extension, restriction or shift of meaning. We have lots of loan translations where roots were associated with Arabic roots and, and derivative words were created. We have the usage of rare biblical words and biblical exegesis in order to create new philosophical and scientific terms in Hebrew. We have a very interesting, not very widespread phenomenon of what I call metaphorological loan translations. We have a relatively small number of loan words, but really words are taken from other languages. And we have terminological development through the terminological specification and precision within Hebrew language, the Hebrew language. Some of these phenomena are not unique to Hebrew philosophical terminology, others are. But what hopefully has become clear is that the project shut in context and its database will also help to shed more light on the inner dynamics of the philosopher's Hebrew. In that way, it will help to understand the way how a previously unphilosophical, so to speak, language could absorb philosophical concepts. In that respect, the development of the Hebrew language resembles in many aspects that of Arabic a few centuries, centuries earlier, as studied, for example, by Dimitri Gutas, Gerhard Endres in the Glossarium Greco Arabicum and others, and in medieval Latin as investigated by Dag Hasse in the Arabic Latin glossary. Accordingly, the philosophical and scientific cultures in the Islamical, Islamic world and later on in the Latin world are not only the historical, cultural and linguistic context from which Hebrew terminology has to be studied, but they are also parallel cases, historical parallel phenomena that can and should in the end be studied in a comparative perspective. So this is more or less the general outlook and the general purpose of our project. And with these remarks, I would like to pass on to Mickey and then to Florian. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. Can you all hear me? Okay, so 
Um, thank you again, Raymond, for your um, presentation. And to a large extent, what I'm going to demonstrate now is really how Raymond's comment and uh, theoretical uh, insights and introduction are reflected in the database. If I would need to sort of extract one, because there were many things that Raymond touched upon, and unfortunately, uh, I couldn't uh, exemplif exemplify them all, and probably we couldn't even discuss them all in the discussion section. So if I would really need to uh, extract one um, idea or even one term, it is really that of context. So the importance of studying, documenting, researching, and then when using the um, database, studying medieval philosophical terminology within context. Okay, so this is the really the main idea. And if I would need to even a bit more in detail to go into what I'm going to show you now in the next 15 minutes, is that this context is extremely essential, or it is essential and to an extent, extremely essential in works that were written originally in Hebrew and where one could perhaps be led mistakenly to assume that because they were written in Hebrew, the context uh, matters less. So this is really in a nutshell what uh, I want to uh, uh, present to you today, again, very much in the context of the database itself. So let me first of all share my screen. Just nod if it's, yeah, it's okay, sharing, okay. So, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, thank you again, Raymond. A and again, in what follows, I will turn to the database uh, itself and building on your presentation, uh, will show how these theoretical considerations come into practice in our work in the database. So first, because everything was pretty much theoretical till now, uh, let me briefly explain the structure and function of the database with few examples. At its core, the database contains more than currently, and the list grows uh, daily, it won't be exaggerated to say that it grows daily, more than 5,600 terms or lemmas. Uh, these are terms or lemmas in Hebrew, so from the Hebrew medieval philosophical and scientific uh, literature. Every lemma or term is attributed with at least one, but more often more than one uh, definition, with some lemmas having between 10 and 20 definitions. Thus, the lemma makom, for example, to which I will return uh, 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 later as well, the, the lemma, the term makom may mean as some of you uh, well know, it can mean reason, ground, numerical rank in mathematical treatises. Makom can mean a physical place, like in modern Hebrew. It can mean point of view, and it can also mean God. And again, I will return to this point shortly. Moreover, in addition to the definitions themselves, the database also supplies, again, this keyword, the context of the terms and of the definition. So the context is first given by a long list of Hebrew quotations, which are manually, as Raymond said, manually selected by us and which contain the search term and exemplify its usage and definition. Moreover, there is also the context which is essentially non-Hebrew or more specifically, which contains equivalents in other languages, mainly Arabic, but also Greek and Latin. So enough with theoretical introductions. Let's look at the database itself or screenshots from the database. Okay, so here is really a basic example. <clears throat> I hope you can see with the cursor. The lemma is Sechel, of course, a key uh, a philosophical term. The lemma is Sechel. Here you are given the first definition. So Sechel has many definitions. Here it's just a screenshot of the first definition. And Sechel, again, as many of you may know, it, it can, may mean intellect, simply intellect predicated of sub and super lunar rational beings, okay? And here the word in the original, yeah, as again, returning to Raymond's introduction in the word in the original or the word which Sechel translates is akal, given here in both Arabic script and in Judeo-Arabic. So this is first, you have the context of the word in the original and here, you have also what I mentioned a minute before, you have the quotations where these terms are present. So here you have the term Sechel. Sechel <clears throat> appears in a quotation from Maimonides, from the Guide of the Perplexed. Okay, Hasechel, Hamaskil, Vamuskal. 
And here you have the very same quotation in the original Judeo-Arabic Al-Aqa, okay? So this was just to hopefully give you really a visual, a, 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 a concrete visual, visualization of the fact that we give the definition and then contextualize it both within uh, quotations and um, <clears throat> quotations in the Hebrew and in the original language, and also with the equivalent uh, terms and the terms in the original language. So hopefully this is more or less clear and I will return to the structure in the rest of my uh, uh, talk as well. So a vast majority of terms documented uh, um, in, the, in the database are therefore a Hebrew rendering. I can stop sharing for a second. So, yeah, so a vast majority of terms documented in the uh, uh, database are therefore Hebrew renderings of already existing Arabic and Greek philosophical terms. Okay. You, you should have gotten this idea by now. Using a metaphor to, to which I shall return later, the Jewish med medieval philosopher may therefore be li linked, likened to a chess player who has ready-made chess pieces with given values. And the creativity lies not so much in granting values to the pieces, but how to maneuver the pieces around. Okay, so up until now, Ramon's presentation and my illustration were so to an extent a unit, but now I would like to delve more and try to get things a bit more exciting and interesting, if, if that uh, is even possible, and to speak about this rendering of context. How do we do that? And this is a really complex uh, uh, process, which involves different sets of qualifications on our side and emphasis. So I really try to think, well, what would be most beneficial for the present purposes? And I chose to focus on one major classification, which we make regarding the corpus, uh, the difference between documenting terms which appear in translations versus those which appear in original works. So let's begin with the translations. Following from all that was said, one may gather already the translations are really a paradigmatic act for the medieval Jewish philosophy and philosophers as their activity is explicitly indebted to an existing discourse, that of the Greco-Arabic philosophical tradition. From our perspective, as the Pshat in Context database editors, translations are essential to our activity from several aspects, several aspects. First, they allow us to see, with a minimal degree of error or speculation, what was the original meaning of a given Hebrew term, right? If you have a translation and you have the original text, you can simply go to the original text and try to find out what are they trying to translate. So I'm sharing the, uh, sorry, I'm sharing it again. Sorry, whoop. Okay. So here, for example, <clears throat> and I think I will stop, I will stop with the stop sharing because it's sort of, um, yeah, it gets out of context, if you don't mind the pun. Okay, so we have, for example, <clears throat> the term uh, makom. Now, makom, which I mentioned earlier, is a noun, the gender, male. So this is the basic morphological uh, data. And then in the database, we have 13 possible definition of the term makom, the lemma makom. All of these definition, and this is the critical uh, 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 point, are rooted in texts and in quotations that we dug out. And many of these quotations are translations and we can see the original text, okay? So in the text of uh, uh, makom, you have, for example, this uh, definition, place in text context, okay? And this place, uh, sorry, you have this definition of place in text context, and you have the original uh, term maldiun, and then you have the term appears in a Hebrew quotation. In a, sorry, that, yeah, you have the term appear appearing in a Hebrew quotation, which is a translation of Averroes' epitom on the Decaigo. And the main point here is that the word here is in the plural form, mekomot, but mekomot here 
is an exact translation of the word here. And you can really see, again, returning to this term, you can see the context. We can witness this directly in this Hebrew, uh, Arabic into Hebrew translation of Averroes epitome of the Kaelo. The context is immediately present and evident. Now, as I mentioned before, the word makom may also designate God. However, if it was in this particular meaning, then the Arabic would not have been maudiun, as the term makom as God has its sources in Talmudic tractates, not in Arabic uh, literature, okay? So this to an extent, I'm, I'm stating the obvious that when you have the original, if it's a translation, if you have the original in front of you, it really makes life easier for, easier for us as editors uh, uh, giving the definitions, supplying the definitions, but also to the users as we make the entire process transparent. Okay. Um, yeah, I've said that already. To conclude again, in other words, the importance of the translations is both as the measurement to assess our understanding of certain terms, but it's also as these translations are often the birthplace of the vast majority of medieval philosophical terminology. Okay, I have to speed up a bit. So I will just say that in some cases, I'm still speaking about the translations now. In some cases, the translators themselves supplied explanations and reflections on their terminological choices in the form of separate treatises. Okay, so I will show this now. Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay. Here we have, for example, a famous example is Samuel Ibn Tibon, Tibon's Perusha Milim Azarot, where the latter documents and explains the meaning of his Hebrew terminological choice. In the example here in front of you, Ibn Tibon gives an explicit account of how, while he himself chose the word Geshem to translate the Arabic word Jism because of the phonetic similarity. Maimonides, however, Ibn Tibon tells us, chose to use instead the Hebrew term goof, okay? So in these cases, such expli explicit reflections by the translators themselves are highly valuable to us. As in the current case, we may dig out two possible words, which mean body, that of Geshem, and that of goof. Okay, so this was, this was the first part. And the, the second one would be shorter, but this was the first part really to highlight the importance of translate translations in our work, Transla translations and treatises of me meta and reflective nature on the translations are extremely valuable, both for the editors as well for the users of the database, as from them we gather an immediate look into what Hebrew words actually stood for in their original medieval context. Now, here a problem presents itself. What if we are not sure about the meaning of the Arabic term itself, yeah? So Arabic terminology in itself uh, is a field of many ambigu ambiguities as Florian Dunkla will uh, present soon and as other par parallel projects testify, okay? So for example, the term Maudiun, which I just uh, mentioned can mean several things also in the Arabic. In addition, in some cases, the Arabic is regrettably lost. Therefore, our aim in Peshat in context is to try and widen the context as much as possible and, where applicable, to document the Greek and Latin sources as well. Otherwise, when none of the sources in other languages are available, these contexts may be supplied through alternative Hebrew translations to the same passage, and really because of time constraints, only two short examples. What you see in front of you now? Okay. So this is a, a Hebrew translation of Aristotle's De Anima, a translation that was made from the Arabic, which is regrettably lost. Now, uh, as in Peshat, we aspire for maximal, uh, maximal transparency. We present the reader with the information that a link is missing here, yeah? quote from a lost source. We don't have the Arabic anymore. However, we do have the, sorry, we do, have the Greek, which you see in front of you. So while we tell you that the Arabic is lost, we have the Greek and the user may therefore witness for herself the parallel between the Hebrew sentence, which is 
a translation of the Greek, dogar, aletes, enai, to, phenomenon. Okay, so you, you, you can see it for yourself. And we also have, although the Arabic is lost, we also have the Latin translation of the Arabic. The same sentence, que emet wa inyan anirelain, quod veritas es res manifesta. So because of the Greek and the uh, Latin veritas, in the, uh, we, we may be sure enough that Hebrew here, the emet in yellow means truth. Okay. Um, mm, 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 okay. Very briefly, the next example here, the Latin, uh, the, the Arabic is lost, but we have two Hebrew translations. These are two Hebrew translations of Averroes' middle commentary on the metaphysics, okay? Um, and, in, uh, and in cases like, that, like these, when we have two Hebrew translations of the same work, we always make sure methodologically to document them side by side. And because we do that, the user, and here it is you, plural, you can read the two, for those of you who can read Hebrew, you can see it's very clearly two translations of the very same lost Arabic. And here again, despite the lack of the Arabic source, the dual Hebrew translation supplies the contextual framework needed for interpretation. In this case, the terms Bekiut and Ergel. And while the semantic fields of each of the terms is wide enough, their mutual illum illum illumination in the context of the two quotations allow us to determine that the term in both translations stands for something like proficiency, familiarity. Okay, and everything that I said now is also true for works in, uh, within the Latin context. And recently uh, we have inserted to the database Thomas Aquinas de Ente et Essentia, and again, inserting the Hebrew translation passages to the uh, uh, Hebrew translation of this work, digging out the uh, uh, terms and the definitions from these passages, and at the same time, in parallel, inserting and connecting the Hebrew quotations with the original Latin quotation of the orig original work the Latin uh, uh, version of Thomas Aquinas's work. To really conclude this, whatever the language is, in the case of translations, and this really should be clear enough by now, document, documenting the origin is a must, both on the term and on the quotation level. In the next four minutes, I will really now go to the second part of what I began with the importance of contextualizing terminology also in the case of original works. As pointed to by Raymond in his introductory presentation, the same rule applies to medieval philosophical works that were originally composed in Hebrew. Although composed in Hebrew, it would be a grave mistake to refer, refer to all of these works automatically as inherently Hebrew or inherently Jewish. By definition, being composed in the context, discourse, and genre of medieval philosophy, the terminology of these works is to be understood in context as well. And I hope I can convince you with a very brief example. In the following slide, we see a citation from Gersonides' famous Wars of the Lord. This work was composed in Provence in the 14th century. It is considered one of the most original works of medieval philosophical thought and if I may testify as someone who, who worked and who studies, studied this work, it is remarkably original, philosophically speaking. Being written in Provence, far away geog geographically and temporarily from the golden age of Arabic influence on Hebrew philosophical terminology, it was written in Hebrew. Yeah? Unlike uh, Alevi Zakuzari or Maimonides' guide, it was written originally in Hebrew. Now, in the passage that I'm showing you now, how many of the words that you see here, and if, if you can, maybe I give you 10 seconds to write your guesses in the, in the comment section, how many of the words do you think are rooted in the Greco-Arabic tradition of terminology of the translation? The answer is all of them. What do I mean by all? All nouns, adjectives, and verbs are familiar technical terms with a fixed meaning and an Arabic background. And I'm only um, 
I'm only giving you here two example. We have Mufarak, yeah? So you have Nivdal. Nivdal is simply a translation of Mufarak. How do we know that? Because it's documented in 15 other works in the Peshat in Context database, including translations. And the same goes for Ribuy Bilti Baal Tachlit. So Bilti Baal Tachlit, infinity, again, a translation of an Arabic term, which is documented in seven other works in the Peshat in Context database. Actually, it is documented in more, in, slight, in a slightly different rendering. So, okay, so the point here is that although it was written in Hebrew, the case of Gershonid, Gersonides is a clear example how the context is also essential in unlocking the meaning and understanding original philosophical uh, Hebrew works at all, as well. Okay, a really a very small uh, um, um, exemplification. So to conclude, and really this is my final uh, note, while you may have understood the overall structure of the database, the logic behind it, the theoretical considerations, the attempt to apply them in the database, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, perhaps on the other hand, you may be at this point somewhat disappointed. What is, after all, the dimension of originality that we want to locate or to attribute to the corpus of medieval philosophical works? Why bother studying this corpus if? its terminological backbone is both fixed and deeply entrenched in other terminological tradition. Yeah? So if my interest is in the history of thought, in the de development of philosophy in the Jewish tradition, why to bother? And here I return to the chess metaphor and to the claim that creativity may express itself also through the involvement of fixed game pieces. And I, this is the last slide. I return to Gersonides. Gersonides in the following sentence, again, from the words of the Lord, expresses the somewhat radical idea that personal fulfillment is gained through the acquiring of earthly intelligence. Okay? In, other idea, in other words, that to fulfill yourself, you need to learn the sciences, having nothing to do with religious idea. Now, it's a bit crude, but more or less, this is what he said here. So this is a starkly secular idea. Again, yeah, that's a secular idea, which while was circulating in different times and places during the medieval and Renaissance era, it certainly wasn't commonly practiced in Jewish circles. And this is really the point that I want to transfer. Yet in manifesting this somewhat radical idea, Gersonides shows himself as being terminologically traditionalist. Again, all of the key words here, Hatzlachatenu, our fulfillment, yeah, Saada is a Felicity is documented in 23 works in the Peshat in context database. Same goes for Tahlid, Gol, Kinyan, Acquisition, Muskal, Intelligible. So all of these are, uh, um, um, again, deeply rooted in the tradition. To conclude, stop share. To conclude. The nature and structure of the database reflects, or at least aims to reflect the structure and nature of the discourse. It does so by supplying the original terms and original quotations, as well as parallel quotations in all relevant languages. All these may be referred to as the core activity of Peshat in context. Another method of expanding its contextual horizons is by collaborations with parallel projects, which is what my esteemed colleague uh, Florian Dunkla will present now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I will now present to you a key aspect of our project, which, however, also goes beyond Pshat and poses questions to research in a digital age as a whole. Pshat was, from its very beginning, which is now more than a decade ago, created as a digital project. Its central tool is the dictionary database whose software framework has been developed further to ensure proper maintenance and technological progress for at least the next dec decade to come. It is constantly turning into a more sophisticated form to cope both with technological updates and extended research interests. Chat is a project in the so-called digital humanities. Digital humanities, according to our understanding, does not simply mean to create a repository of data accessible online in the most basic form and made public to scholars worldwide. The adjective digital describes not the mere transfer of data from a sheet of analog paper to a digital one, but to a whole new dimension for collaborative and interdisciplinary computational supported research and its publication, which would and should open new perspectives on the non-digital data 
and introduce new methods and solutions for research questions, which in an analog context would have not emerged. Therefore, data has not only to be made available, but to be reorganized in the most intelligent way, which is foremost oriented to questions researchers of a certain field of scholarship pose towards it, some of which have been described in the two previous parts of this presentation. As mentioned by Raymond in the first part, the general development of the Hebrew language resembles in many respects that of Arabic when it came into contact with the Greek classic works of philosophy a few centuries earlier, namely in the ninth century, or medieval Latin, when translations of the same works were conducted from the Arabic in the 12th and 13th century. Therefore, the ambition to seek for digital collaborations with researchers and research projects in the fields of non-Hebrew linguistics and general medieval philosophy, which would generate a holistic approach towards the phenomenon of the appropriation of philosophical long language in translingual contexts is absolutely logical. From the technological point of view, which means looking at it from an IT developer's side, the current means and the state of realization of these and other collaborations and the level of mutual integration of data still leaves a lot of opportunities and options to be possibly realized in the future. I will now describe three different types of collaborations Pshat has initiated in the past three years, referring to their scientific as well as their technological aspects and show how Pshat data is represented in the context of other research projects on Hebrew and non-Hebrew terminology. I will assess the technological advantages and disadvantages of the current integration and outline possible future improvements. Two projects already mentioned are the Arabic and Latin glossary and the Glossarium Greco-Arabicum. The Glossarium Greco-Arabicum already started in the pre-digital era of the 1980s under the supervision of Gerhard Enders in cooperation with Dimitri Guthers and is dedicated to the preparation of a Greek Arabic lexicon now hosted by the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. The once prepared 80,000 analog file cards were digitized and provide an online glossary for classical Greek philosophical writings. A similar project is the Arabic and Latin glossary, a dictionary in the making, edited by Doug Nikolaus Hasse, University of Würzburg. It provides the vocabulary of the Arabic to Latin translations of the Middle Ages based on Arabic Latin glossaries in modern editions of medieval works. In chat, Arabic and Latin equivalent terms documented as a result of our analysis of Arabic to Hebrew translations are supplemented by references to entries in both glossaries which are attached manually in the form of persistent URL links to the existent databases results, external databases results. These connections provide a wider context to each Arabic and Latin term. The mode of connection is the simplest, yet also a quite superficial and non one directional way. There is no real difference between what Chat does with the explicit consent of the conductors of these projects and what a regular visitor of these websites would do who manually searches for roots or terms and then copy pastes a link to the result into a footnote in his paper or article. The two source projects had to take no technological efforts to create alternative interfaces for data export between them and chat. However, the big disadvantages are also clear. Everything needs to be done manually since no automatic harvest or input of data is conducted. As a consequence, every change in the source of the connection link, be it of old data or of new data to be added, would not be automatically updated and the risk to lose connection due to outdated information is imminent. Since the two projects like Pshat are currently still in the making, a possible useful op option would be a regular automatized matching of equal entries and the automatic creation of links. In the case of the Arabic and Latin glossary, this could be done for the Latin by automatic spelling comparison, either via an internal interface or by a procedure called scrapping, which is comparable, comparable to what Google bots do. Another project closely related to Pshat in terms of both subject and language is the MISPA project of the ETH Zurich under supervision of Roy Wagner. MISPA the name of the project is the Hebrew word for number, creates an open access online database of annotated transcripts of all surviving Hebrew medieval arithmetic and algebraic treatises. The common interests of Pshat and Mispah lies in Hebrew mathematical terminology. 
While Pschatt's corpus of Hebrew philosophical text does not include mathematical works, although mathematical terminology is documented wherever found, Ms. Parr does provide digital editions of those works from manuscripts and generates from them a Hebrew English, English Hebrew lexicon of mathematical terms. Ms. Parr has agreed upon a cooperation with Pschatt, which includes that both projects will share the lemmata, create identical English definitions for mathematical terms using the Pschatt definition ID number and enable Pschatt's users, users to get linked to Ms. Parr's research data. In contrast to the one directional approach and the cooperation with the above mentioned projects, here both partners do integrate information from the other, allowing changes to their own data and creating mutual links in the databases. For IT experts, though, the method of realization may be nevertheless still far away from anything over ambitious, ambitious or visionary. Basically, the researchers responsible for the data exchange, uh, data exchange share an Excel file on Google Docs in which lemmata definitions and the digital identifiers are noted down side by side. In each database, the research personnel manually adjust the data to match with that in the shared file. In Pshat, the connection is established by a link attached to every definition and term existing in this part. Although the scientific surplus is out of question, the efforts to be taken are still quite high, as data sharing only works manually via a third external platform, and the problem of data changes remains, only to be solved by the attentiveness of the editors. A third and last example for a highly benefiting and complementary cooperation for even both parties is the current integration of me medical Hebrew terminology from Garrett Boss' Concise Dictionary of Novel Medical and General Hebrew Terminology from the Middle Ages, published in 2019. The big difference to the other two corporations is that the dictionary is not a database, but a book available as a print or digital copy at Brill. The connection of Boss and Platt's efforts is beneficial for any researcher interested in medieval uh, medical terminology, since both approaches are like in the case of uh, Ms. Parr and Platt, complementary to each other. On the one side, Pshat is not systematically documenting medical terminology since the vast corpus of medical Hebrew literature would have gone far beyond the limited resources of our already ambitious project. Yet Pshat has documented some medical terminology in the context of not specifically medical works where one would have might less expected them. On the other side, Boss Dictionary represents the core of medical terminology documented from the major works on medicine in Hebrew and published in his uh, five volume novel medical and general Hebrew terminology from the Middle Ages series started in 2011, which makes it an enormous gain for a user of Pshat who will not only be hinted to the entry of a specific term that Gerrit Boss has as a true uh, expert documented, but might as well be notified about its occurrence in the, co occurrence in the context of non-medical works Pshat has scrutinized. To give just one concrete uh, terminological example, the term auric in combination with different adjectives is documented by Boss for the meanings carotid arteries, non-throbbing wings, vessels, and wings, as translations of the Arabic term urk, which comes from a root analog to the Hebrew. A user in chat will now not only learn about these definitions, about which are also the normative, among which are also the normative meanings of the term in modern Hebrew, but will also be informed that in Samuel Ibn Tibon's translations of Maimonides' treatise on resurrection, the term was also employed to mean muscle as a translation of the Arabic asala. Although this alternative meaning did not prevail to become a meaning of auric in later translations, translations, still less in modern Hebrew, it is a good example how both the multilingual dimension of Pshat, as well as its endeavor to unite different directions of research in one single digital place, produces a more complete picture of the historical phenomenon. Pshat will integrate to its database around 1,300 main entries and a much greater number of sub-entries from the concise dictionary. A future step will be to enlarge this corpus by the terminology and references from the whole series. The integration in Pshat is done half automatic, a so-called web-ready content file of Boss Dictionary, which contains the text with all formatting information like paragraphs, fonts, etc., encoded in XML format, was manually tagged with additional ID markers, which make every entry identifiable for our system. 
These entries were imported to our database in which they can be connected to newly added lemma time definitions. The visualization of the dictionary entries is provided as an overlay to the browser window, partly comparable to snippet view in Google Books, though displaying at least a complete and relevant entry. In the case of Boss Dictionary, Pratt was able to fully and mostly automatically import research data. Currently, the level of integration applies only to the lemma entry level. Yet we plan to deepen the integration in our system with searches enabling to filter by work, author, and or translator. Conclusions. What our IT developers complain about constantly is the lack of common standards for automatic data sharing in digitized projects in the humanities in general and in the study of texts in particular. Although those standards do exist in other contexts, for example, library science, this aspect seems not yet to be in the focus of researchers in digital humanities as a whole. This surely has a number of structural reasons which belong more to the questions on how research is planned, financed, and conducted. The development and integration of an interface for digital export and the sharing of valuable data gained from laborious and expensive scientific endeavor seems not to be what scholars consider worthwhile. The diversity in software frameworks by which digital projects can be realized, as well as the incompatibility of data sets and formats is an obstacle which necessitates a lot of financial and human resources to, for to be overcome, not to mention the willingness of independent projects to accept uh, changes to their own scientific model and method. This seems to be the reason why an even greater amount of time and efforts is more likely to be spent on copy pasting of web links rather than advanced technological solutions. As a result, which is our experience at least, real existent digital humanity remains often estranged from the dream of the creation of an interconnected digital universe of knowledge. Mutual corporations could be far more often and by far more efficiently realized at the end. However, Chad was and is oriented towards more scientific and technological corporations in digital humanities in whatever form possible for its partners, and it encourages others to think about more sophisticated solutions. Such, such a solution for shared data seems to be the creation of an independent research platform that functions as an overarching meta service and meta search engine, enabling a translingual research for terms from all relevant classical languages, which would lead to results from the connected databases relevant to the field. Building up such an infrastructure maintained and financed by the participating institutions should be considered as a logical step to unite the strengths of the single projects and possibly reduce the risk to vanish into a digital nirvana. It is our great vision, which has begun to form in the recent years, that at the end of such efforts would stand the creation of a so-called single point of entry for researchers of Hebrew and non-Hebrew philosophical terminology. As this is currently a potency yet to become actualized one day, Pratt is strengthening its efforts to realize a smaller vision by its own limited means, in order to become a single point of entry for Hebrew scientific terminology, which includes also references to the historical dictionary project of the Hebrew language and to the dictionary of the Targumim, Talmud Babli, Talmud Yerushalmi, and Midrashic literature by Marcus Gesto, available at Wikisource. Chat already today enables users with specific interests in Hebrew philosophy and terminology to access via a single simple search a number of relevant original sources, databases, dictionaries, and lexica to contextualize their research in an interdisciplinary manner. Thank you. Thank you all so much for this really fascinating presentations. And I mean, the project is, is wonderful, but I mean, ending with Florian's uh, remarks, I mean, it is clear that um, you all and we all should think of the future that this wonderful achievements will not be lost, but rather uh, be developed any further. So um, I invite the audience to, um, to put any questions or comments or ideas they may have into the chat so that we can start the discussion. Um, I, I, one of my questions that, that I had is that, um, I mean, you, you, you showed the rather positive um, and, and equal collaboration with Ms. Ba in the sense that you both in, in two directions integrate the data. 
um, what is the? It, it doesn't seem to be this uh, bidirectional for for the for the Arabic uh, Latin lexicon, and neither for the Arabic Greek. I mean, what is what is their reception of what you are doing, and to what extent are they integrating, if at all, any of your data? Um, perhaps I may may, may answer in, in this point. We um, we are not not only passively integrating the things, and we are in in. in Dialogue, especially with the with the um, Arabic Latin dictionary, um, one of the the main tools for for a, um, I mean they could could enter chat entries, but it's it's actually uh, less important for them because they Hebrew does not really play an, an integral role in the in, in the material they are researching. But what uh, what really would be important, and we have already started to discuss this is to to develop a um, a model which allows to identify data for um, terms in different languages automatically through meta search engines in different databases which means that uh, that there will be an automatic way to identify and to find out whether a project like um, like the arabic latin glossary does have information for example about a, an arabic word which is also documented in chat and this will only be possible if we finally will reach a, a situation that there will be fixed ID, IDs for um, for such linguistic entities for for terms. This is something which uh, which has been discussed in many lexicographical projects. Also, the Parasoys, um Greek Dictionary has discussed it, and it's quite deplorable that uh, that actually we are there is no such standard neither for arabic nor for hebrew nor for for any other um, uh, language and i'm discussing we have been discussing with uh, with dark Hasse a project which would actually develop exactly this model a, a kind of uh, id system in order to to identify lexico lexicographical entities in different similar projects like um like Trat. so that that's actually the future and the direction we want to develop it into mm. Thank you. Um, so we have one one formal question: whether the the video will be available uh, at some stage. Uh, we will publish this, and this is something that will be decided later on. But as you can see, we are recording. Um, I wanted to ask something. Uh, you guys mentioned uh, doing harvesting and scraping. I mean, have you decided on not to do it because of quality of the materials that you're ingesting, or is it the complication of um, creating the connections with the different meanings. Um, what has been your, um, what has hold you back on that one? If, if you have tried it, I mean. Well, I didn't, didn't understand this, the beginning of the, the question actually, sorry. So yeah. it's the method, method of ingesting um, volume of of material from other from other sources like ingesting you you do it either by harvesting or scraping um other sources um and i'm wondering if if the uh, you mentioned that you're not using it and i'm wondering if it's because of the um the i guess the creating of the connections with the materials is what's what's tricky yeah yeah, yeah, that's uh, the, the connection. Uh, I, I think the, the, the question is a very important one for two reasons. One is the composition of IT. Not every, uh, every database has the same language. That is a problem. We have not a common language in, a, in, a, in a, uh, according, uh, I don't know, according to uh, how, how it was programmed or the or things. And maybe one program or one language, or you know better than I, it is a, a lot of uh, of discussion. Second thing is that uh, a database can function if uh, if you have also a a common um, a common uh, uh, lexicography. And that is important one. Company published two two years ago uh, a, a volume on on philosophical technology in Arabic sources. Yeah, in Italian, how to use that? It's nothing online. It's only a uh, only book. That is uh, how to to follow the the. There is no possibility, and therefore should be the the. Only, I, I think the universities 
and the other intellectual world should be should be together and to try to, to find a common language and then we can use uh, also other other uh, other other database or, or other uh, other uh, philosophical terminology it would be also the latin one it's important one very important the syriac one is very important one and, and so uh, on yeah probably we need a vibe system for uh for terminology, I mean, we have it for library systems, so why not adapt the system then also? That, that's exactly the point, but, but and the library system is based upon it's a, a, a developed system of IDs, where you actually can, exactly. can unify, unify different standards which are prevalent in different libraries, exactly. and, and you can, can identify and bring together the information, and that's exactly the the model I'm, I, I try to develop also for, for um, all the relevant languages. And I've seen that there was a question about Syriac. Syriac is definitely yeah. also something which is relevant, mm. and which we uh, would like to integrate. We also are in contact with the, with the Hunainet project in, in Vienna. We're actually doing an excellent research on the, on the Syriac translation and Syriac text. Um, we have so far not been able, but that's not a matter of principle, but a matter, matter of, of manpower and budget been able to, to uh, integrate any Syriac terminology and quotations as links between the Greek and the between the Greek and the Arabic, but um, we would love to do so. It's not, mm -hmm. uh, not a matter of principle, but a matter of uh, practice. Yeah, I mean, we have a couple of Syriac uh, studies scholars among the, in, among the audience and uh, including also George Kios, and, and he's also having a number of digital projects, um, which some of them may be relevant. So that's, um, so we have another question from Jose Martinez Delgado. What about the early grammatical terminology from Karaites and uh, Andalusis that later will be translated into Hebrew by authors such as uh, Abraham bin Ezra, Kim, the Kimhi family, or Ibn Tibon? This terminology is rooted in the mantic terminology and the peripatetic tree. The uh, Porphyrian tree, I'm sorry. It's very yeah. uh, again, it's a, it's, it's a matter, it's, it's not a matter. We have in, in our, we have subjects, a subject index for Fripshat and their grammar, grammatical terminology is, is listed. When we had to apply and, and submit a list of, uh, of works we, we want to, to scrutinize in the project, we also had to think about the, the the people who would be able to carry out the work, and and again for practical reasons we decided not to integrate it. But uh, the big advantage of, of a digital project such as Pshat is of course that you always can supplement it in the future, and mm -hmm. uh, and we we last no, not last year it was before Corona but uh, not long ago we we invited Aaron Maman to give a. Uh, a, a seminar to, to Pshat on, on grammatical terminology. A uh, person here is a professor from the uh, Hebrew language department here in Jerusalem. And we actually pointed out exactly the, the interconnection between grammatical terminology and, and philosophical terminology. And it would be an, a wonderful um, supplement yeah. and actually a necessary supplement to what, what there is already in the database. The terminology very similar one. Uh, I think the we had a project in the Halle on the Halle uh, on the grammatical terminology of the first uh, grammatic in the Middle Ages, and it was very similar. There's no no uh, no substantial difference. But we need a, a, a list. We, we need also not only the grammar. It is also the astrological uh, astronomical terminology. It's of a scientific one, but some of them is not scientific one. There was also the the also the, the temptation to include the Kabbalistic and the mystical literature. It was often very, very similar, but for the a, a world uh, per se, we cannot do all things. We can do uh, only some three terms and we try to initiate a, a, a new a new uh, to try to a new community. To, uh, to try to, to interchange, to exchange the, the research. Yeah. But may, we may need a... Sorry. Pardon? Sorry. Josepha. No, okay, okay. 
Yeah, okay. I just wanted to, exactly to that, if I just may add very briefly, because we spoke a lot about terminology, etc., and then also about uh, um, digital humanities considerations, etc., et but not so much maybe about the subject matter. So perhaps just in two sentences, and my colleagues may, may correct me here, but it's really important to also for the people here to understand that although, for example, we began the collaboration with Ms. Parr quite recently, which means that now a huge number of uh, um, terms and definition, so something like 1,200 new mathemat mathematical definitions enter the database. That's grand, that's wonderful. However, this does not mean that prior to, th to that, there were no mathematical uh, terms and definitions in the database. Why? Because of the nature, and really here, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but when you, when you are working with this type of medieval uh, scientific and philosophical, the, the boundaries are often very blurred. So you will have a philosophical treatise, but of course, the author will speak also about mathematics, about physics, about, so just, and my point is that the, these collaborations with BOSS or with the a medical project, med medical terminology with this part, really helps us to refine and to really contribute both qu quantitatively and qualitatively to seeds of, of uh, uh, terminological trees which are already in the database. So it's, and this is also true, not for the Syriac, I mean, when, when if you, the question of language is another one, but when it comes to the subject tagging here, at times the, the borders are more blurred. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Um... I think we have to come to an end as, as uh, fascinating as, as this is. So um, I hope that um, um, many of the people who, who listened into to this uh, webinar are really intrigued by what you're doing. And I assume that some of them will also contact you with ideas and suggestions. Um, so uh, it remains to me to, to thank you all for this fascinating presentation. And um, please also note that uh, we have a number of uh, upcoming events. We have this year, this, this uh, week, we have the Ignaz Goldsia conference. And then we have um, more talks coming up in, in December and of course the next year. And um, I pass to Maria now because this is also part of the digital scholarship uh, conversations at the IAS and, and she has a boatload of other um, events going on. So Maria, I pass to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all the speakers for a fascinating talk. I mean, the, you can tell that the the kind of like the sky is the limit of, uh, and it's a, but it's a process and I can understand that it's a, it's a step-by-step -step thing. Um, I want to uh, thank them again and uh, invite you all to uh, join us for upcoming events. Like Sabine mentioned, we have the God's Here conference next week. We have the author's voice coming up in December. And uh, visit our websites, uh, either the IAS-HS Islamic World Events or IAS.edu uh, Digital Scholarship for upcoming events. And I hope you can join us again. Thank you. Thank you thank very you, much. Uh, thank you, Sabina. Thank you, Maria, for the, the, for the wonderful possibility to speak about our project. But uh, we will uh, we will also have it together uh, in the future. I hope it <laughs> that we will go together. Thank you, thank you very much. Just know that Godzilla starts in two days. It's not next week; it's this week. <laughs> so it starts Friday. A, a big, a big point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much, and again uh, for this opportunity to to encourage people to contact us and to 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 refresh the the research with new ideas. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.